Hi everyone, welcome to our um, webinar session talking about long COVID. So as many of you probably already know, I'm Helen Drake. I'm the Clinical Education Manager at Cytoplan. Um, and I'm running lots of these webinars, so hopefully you're going to enjoy this one. Obviously, long COVID is a really big issue at the moment. Um, we're still in the grips of the COVID-19 pandemic and we're seeing um, increasing amounts of people that are suffering from long-term symptoms following a COVID infection. So I'm going to talk today a bit about the pathophysiology of what's going on um, during a COVID infection and sort of what um, factors are affecting the sort of persistence of certain symptoms that are lingering for many people. Then obviously we're going to talk about interventions that we can utilise to ameliorate those, those symptoms that people are experiencing. Um, if you do want to ask any questions after listening to the session, then please feel free to email me. This is my email. It's helen at cytoplan.co.uk. Um, so hopefully I'll be hearing from some of you soon. So um, before we get going, let's have a look at some of the stats. And this was the latest ONS survey that was done. Um, but clearly these numbers are only going to be increasing. Um, we're still, we still have reasonably high infection rates, particularly within the UK. Um, and although the vaccine is preventing sort of serious infection, people are still reporting lots of incidences of long COVID. So there are an estimated 1.1 million people in the UK who are experiencing what's known as self-reported long COVID. So they're basically, they haven't necessarily been diagnosed with long COVID. And the, you know, the, I think the diagnosis, if that's what I want to call it, is going to be a, a grey area um, that people are saying or reporting that they're experiencing long COVID, as it were. So it's estimated that 1.1 million um, people as well in private households, this is 1.7% of the population, uh, were experiencing self-reported long COVID as of the 5th of September 2021. So this is the most late, the latest research that's come out by the ONS survey so far. And of these reporting uh, long COVID symptoms, almost 4 in 10, which is 37%, were experiencing um, these symptoms over a year after the first suspected infection. So you know, we're talking about this sometimes as if it's a bit of a prolonged infection going on for two, maybe three months, but some people are experiencing these symptoms still a year later. We really, really want to be supporting those people um, because we're only going to be going down a, you know, a road of further sort of dysfunction going on within the body. Um, and it's only going to affect their lives even more. Um, symptoms adversely affected day-to-day -day activities in around two thirds of those affected. And the most common symptoms we see are fatigue, shortness of breath, loss of smell, difficulty concentrating. So these are the most common ones, but there was a lot of other sort of small sort of specific um, symptoms that other people are experiencing as well, but these is most common. So really um, a lot of um, issues, particularly with cognition. So we're seeing of loss of, on the, and the nervous system. So we're seeing loss of smell, loss of taste, difficulty concentrating, lots of people report brain fog. We're going to be talking about that a lot more. Um, long COVID tends to be more common among those aged 35 to 65, more in females, um, people living in the most deprived areas, those working in health or social care, and those with another health condition or disability. So this is really important to understand because we want to know what are those factors that may be driving long COVID or those sort of predispositions to long COVID that we want to be um, thinking about. And that can really help us when we're using our functional medicine approach to determine what, what those factors are, what those drivers um, and antecedents of disease are. Um, compared with August 2021, self-reported long COVID was higher among young adults aged 17 to 24. And this may be because um, a lot of the population older than that were, had been double vaccinated at that time. Um, so potentially we're getting less infection. <clears throat> so <clears throat> non-COVID bears quite a large resemblance to what is also known as post-viral fatigue. In fact, it could potentially be the same pathophysiology. Um, and they elicit, both of these elicit symptoms very similar to chronic fatigue syndrome or ME. So myalgic encephalitis, um, 
and those those two are sort of the definition of those two are very crossover a lot they're really considered the same condition however the onset of long covid can be linked to a specific infection obviously in this case it's going to be a covid-19 infection so let's have a look at what's going on um, initially during a um, the, the transmission to start with of COVID. So this is a really common sort of cycle that you'll see in most um, viral infections. So we first, I guess, inhale or the, the virus is transmitted in our body, usually through inhalation or ingestion. So the virus enters the host, um, the host body via aerosol transmission. That's what's happening in COVID-19. So it's the virus is in the air we inhale it and it attaches to our cells that it comes into contact with. And it binds to host cells via ACE2 um, receptors. And it's the S1 protein or the viral spike protein that's able to um, adhere to those ACE2 receptors. We get conformational changes in the viral spoke, spike protein and this allow viral and host membrane fusion and basically the um, virus is taken into the cell via endocytosis. So it's almost sort of engulfed by the host cell. And the virus then enters the nu um, nuclear caspid. So the entry of the viral nuclear caspid into the host cell then release, releases the viral content. And these viral contents then sort of trigger viral RNA replication. So we get transcription and translation of RNA. And this allows for protein biosynthesis in the cytoplasm of the host cell, and it creates more viral particles. These are then transported um, outside of the cell via Golgi vesicles and um, out through the cell membrane via exocytosis into the extracellular space. So basically, our host cells have um, allowed the replication of more uh, virus cells, and they're then uh, released out into the community. This can be considered infected material that's released um, for community transmission. And that will happen when we're breathing in and out. As we know now, it used to be thought more by, you know, uh, more severe coughing and sneezing, but even just talking, we will release these viral particles back out into the community and, and allow them to be ingested again by a, another host. And this is basically how viruses work. So what do they actually do in the body? Well, as we've already mentioned, they bind to ACE2 receptors and they're taken up into the host cells and we get viral replication. Um, initially, we get very limited immune response because if it's a novel virus, we wouldn't have, we won't have the immune system to necessarily rec um, recognize that specific strain of viruses. Um, so we don't necessarily elicit um, immediate, uh, immediate sort of um, acquired immune response. That takes a bit of time. Um, in most people, 80% of people will sort of just get here. We get an immune response and we can contain the infection and clear the virus in about 10 to 14 days. And this is where a lot of people sort of end up. However, even people that have had a really mild infection, so this will be someone that's, you know, had COVID-19 symptoms, but they're quite mild, a cough or a fever, after 10 to 14 days, they've, they're reasonably well recovered and they're no longer infectious generally. Even if we have this acute infection, we can get long COVID. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but in about one fifth of all patients, we get involvement of the conducting airways in the upper respiratory tract and migration into the lower respiratory tract as well. Um, and we get infection invasion of type two pulmonary alveolar epithelial cells, again, by the ACE2 receptors. So this is basically a deeper lung infection. Once this happened, it releases um, a low, we have a really, really strong inflammatory reaction, we get the release of loads of different cytokines. We call this the, this the cytokine storm. Um, <clears throat> these cytokines, um, activate the immune, um, other parts of the immune system. So they're chemo attractants for neutrophils, which are CD4 and eight cells, along with B cell differentiation. So we're now eliciting more of an acquired immune response. Um, we get um, sequestration of inflammatory cells in the lung tissue, so high amounts of inflammation within the lung, which is important for um, getting rid of the viral infection, but we can get quite severe amounts of lung injury. 
At the same time, we're getting further viral replication within these cells within the lung, um, and they continue, and that's going to cause damage to the local area and loss of healthy tissue. So both this sort of excessive viral replication within that lung tissue, as well as the cytokine storm creating excessive amounts of inflammation, we get severe damage to our lung tissue. And this is when we go into acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. Um, and these are the types of people that will be um, definitely placed on a ventilator um, and would be going into intensive care. So there's sort of two aspects really to long COVID. It's the people who you know, have been severely um, affected and have a severe illness associated with COVID-19 and their recovery. We need to think about that. But also these people that have had you know, reasonably acute infection, but are suffering with long-term impacts um, of this disease. So we would look at them both in a similar way, but there would be slightly different nuances that you would look at with each individual, and we will talk about those. Um, the presence of SARS-CoV-2, which is the strain of um, coronavirus that's causing COVID-19, um, is found in most tissues of the body. So the ones in darker purple um, is where we've seen the most concentration of those viral particles. So certainly in the upper airways, the mouth and the lungs, the immune system, but also the gut and the urinary system. However, one that seems to be playing a real role within um, long COVID is the brain and the cerebrospinal fluid. So we're going to talk about that a lot as well. But you can see from this um, diagram that we're getting the presence of the virus in most tissues of the body. And this is why, particularly with long COVID, we can see such a sporadic um, variety of different symptoms that are coming out in various people. Um, but as we would expect, the most affected is the, the respiratory system and the upper airway. So what actually is long COVID? And it's not yet sort of been really, really well defined. But the WHO have um, put out this definition, which is that post COVID-19 condition occurs in individuals with a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, which is usually three months from the onset of COVID-19 with symptoms and that lasts for at least two months and cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. So it's basically something that's diagnosed if we don't know what else it is and they, we've looked back and they've had COVID. But as I've mentioned before, common symptoms include fatigue, shortness of breath, cognitive dysfunction, but also others and generally have an impact on everyday functioning. Symptoms may be new, um, maybe a new onset following initial recovery from acute COVID-19 or persistent from the initial illness. So some people may almost recover and be fine. And then all of a sudden, a couple of months later, they're starting to experience these symptoms and they can fluctuate and relapse over time. So it's quite a broad definition. Um, but we know there's certain things that have gone on within the physiology that have led them down this path of long COVID and considering post-viral fatigue. Um, and if we don't sort of ameliorate those conditions, we do run the risk of going further down the line to something like chronic fatigue syndrome, um, where it's much harder to get back from that. We need to be thinking about that. So as I mentioned, dys dyspnea, so shortness of breath, brain fog is a really common one. Um, fatigue again, so brain fog and fatigue are probably the, mo the ones that I've seen most within uh, clinic. But we're also getting cardiovascular dysfunction and depression. And then um, anosmia and agresia, which is loss of smell and taste. We may see this during the acute infection, but for some people, this sort of loss of taste and smell persists for a very long period of time. And that's, a, that's an indication that we've had sort of damage and stress that's gone on um, within the nervous system. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a minute. So there's quite a lot of dysfunctions that we want to look at and we want to target. It's likely that um, people that are more prone, and there is some studies that have been done on this, people that are prone to long COVID may have other underlying conditions. So it's not necessarily that they've got, you know, a specific disease. So, and obviously that will put them at greater risk to have diabetes or cardiovascular disease. And we know that puts them at increased risk. 
but other underlying things that might be going on um, can put them at increased risk of long COVID. So we want to look at the respiratory system. We want to look at what those underlying drivers are. The respiratory and the cardiovascular system are going to have been affected initially anyway by the infection, as well as the immune system and inflammation. But we also want to think about energy production and mitochondrial health, adrenal um, function and the HPA axis. So what, has there been lots of stress going on? And if there was a higher amount of stress going on before an infection, it, it may be more likely that they're going to then progress towards long COVID. Nervous system and cognitive function we need to think about and also nutritional depletion. And all of these sort of encompassing is, can be um, affected by and damaged by oxidative stress. And that seems to be one of the main uh, things that has happened during a COVID infection, we've got higher amounts of oxidative stress that's damaged our cells, damaged our tissues, and damaged our ability for our mitochondria to function effectively, which leads to dysfunction of organ systems. So we really want to be targeting this excessive amount of oxidative stress that seems to be going on. So this is a very simplistic diagram, but this is often, you know, how I think about things and you know what are the steps that have led up to. Um, um, dysfunction that's going on in the body. So we've had a viral infection and we know any virus, but particularly with long COVID, we've seen it when we see this cytokine storm that we get high amounts of inflammation. So this triggers an immediate um, immune reaction. We know that high amounts of inflammation create oxidative stress and both inflammation and oxidative stress cause damage to tissues, but in particular, they cause damage to the mitochondria because the mitochondria are less protected within the cell than, you know, particularly um, the nucleus, for example. Um, and obviously mitochondrial dysfunction is essential for energy production. And then energy production itself is essential for the function of all our, you know, of our tissues and our organ systems to work effectively. So, but also we're not producing energy so we can get fatigue, but we can get dysfunction of other bodily tissues. So this is sort of the process that I'm trying to think about. And when we um, have overcome a long COVID infection, the virus is no longer there, but the inflammation and the oxidative stress are potentially still lingering, but certainly the mitochondrial dysfunction can last for a longer period of time. And this is potentially why we have this um, long ongoing condition and things like chronic fatigue syndrome, where we've almost got damage and we're Although the initial thing that's created this damage has gone, we can't quite we can't quite build ourselves back up. And so, how do we do that building back up to get our get our bodies working functionally and optimally again? So, um, supportive interventions. So, first of all, we need to consider underlying underlying conditions. So, was there anything else going on? These are common ones that the IFM talk about. So, there's toxicity. There's celiac disease, you've often got a lot of inflammation going on in the gut and autoimmunity. Inflammate, any level of inflammation, um, hidden infections, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. So if there's any of these underlying conditions, we need to be thinking about those and ameliorating those to start with before we start sort of, you know, trying to target anything further down the line. <clears throat> So particularly if you've got someone that has um, long COVID and they had a really severe disease, I mean, even if they haven't, but, you know, there's certainly those people that were in, that hospitalised with it will have quite significant damage to their respiratory system. So we really want to support respiratory function um, and repair and recovery. So obviously our, um, our, our lungs and our, the rest of our respiratory system is you know, coated with our lovely um, epithelium. And that's really exposed to, you know, the external environment and it's, um, a, it's exposed to, you know, damaging and oxidative factors very, very sort of acutely. So we want to look at epithelial recovery. So things that are really useful for supporting the um, epithelium are vitamin A and D, zinc, as well as short chain fatty acids. So you can take short chain fatty acids orally, but also short chain fatty acids are produced by our gut bacteria. So we talk about a lot. So looking also at the, um, the function of the gut and the balance of bacteria within the digestive system is important here as well. 
Bronchodilation, um, magnesium is really important for this. So, you know, supporting the ability for the, the capacity of the lungs and the lungs being able to expand. And we also want to look at mucous membrane health. Obviously, our because our respiratory system is so exposed to external environment, we need good amounts of mucus to be able to, you know, catch those foreign invaders and expel them from the body as quickly as we possibly can. So things like N-acetylcysteine or NAC, really important for supporting mucous membrane health and vitamin C as well. And obviously both NAC and vitamin C have a really um, positive effect on the immune system. And they're also antioxidants. So I love um, NAC and vitamin C and this type of thing because they do so many different things that support immune health, they're supporting the respiratory function, but they're also great antioxidants as well. So all of those aspects you want to be looking at um, yeah, when you're looking at supporting long COVID. Cardiovascular health. <clears throat> we could go on about this all individually. and we, I will be doing a webinar at some point more talking specifically about cardiovascular health. But we really want to look at supporting um, our heart and blood vessel function because if that's struggling everything else is going to struggle you know we're going to see fatigue because we're just not getting the nutrients and the oxygen you know to the to the tissues that need it if, if our cardiovascular system is sluggish or under stress for example um so we really need to look at interventions that support cardiovascular health obviously again things like antioxidants are really great we have a really great product though cytoprotect cardiovascular that has um citrulline malate, horse chestnut, genacetylcysteine, so we've got quercetin and rutin, grapefruit seed accept, um, extracts. So these are lots of polyphenols, which have anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and specific cardiovascular supporting functions within the body. And then vitamins B1, 2, and 3, really important for mitochondrial function and energy production, as well as vitamin C, which is important for protecting the um, endothelium of the cardiovascular system. So this is a really nice one. Um, it's just, you know, looking at, you know, what the specific needs are of each client um, and whether this would be appropriate for them. And then we really want to think about the stress response. When we are exposed to a, a viral infection, particularly if it's, you know, quite a bad one and we've had um, a bad experience with them, that's going to put us in a state of stress which will increase cortisol and increase adrenaline. And if this is continuous, that's going to aggravate our HPA access and we can get HPA dysfunction. So the adrenal glands can be struggling. Also though, if there was already um, you know, issues with stress or HPA dysfunction before um, infection with COVID-19, that will just exacerbate the problems. So we certainly want to look at supporting the adrenal glands. And we know that when we get HPA dysfunction, we get a lot of symptoms such as brain fog and um, depression and cognitive issues, but also fatigue. So we definitely want to be considering that in your clients. Um, you may want to do uh, adrenal stress testing, like a salivary cortisol test, for example, that might be really, really useful and available in your toolkit. Um, but certainly stress relieving techniques and support for the adrenal glands are going to be really, really important because whether you feel emotionally stressed or not, the impact of um, a viral infection is going to put pressure on the HPA axis. But also just the, you know, the environment that we've been living with for the last, at the moment, it's roughly 18 months. You know, even if you feel like you're coping with it very well, that's still placing stress on the body because we've had such a um, impact on our, all our lives um, that that's going to initiate a stress response within the brain. And stress, again, creates a vicious cycle of inflammation. So we get activation of the HPA axis, which puts us in a stressful situation. The body thinks, oh, there's something stressful there. I'm going to have to fight or flight from a tiger. And what we actually need if we get injured is, you know, a very quick re immune response. So the stress response actually creates inflammation for that reason. And that was really beneficial when we were evolving and we were having to fight tigers. Nowadays, because we're stressed about lots of different things and they're more like ongoing prolonged stress, we don't really want this sort of pro-inflammatory activation. 
inflammation again creates oxidative stress and so so does you know psychological stress as well so all these arrows could actually be you know pointing to each other we get um <clears throat> oxidative stress damages cells means we get nutrient deficiencies because we're using up our antioxidants much more quickly this can affect sleep you can get poor sleep and that can further activate the hpa axis so we need to start breaking breaking this. And also, you know, if we think about sleep and affecting sleep, if we don't sleep very well, that has a really significant impact on our immune system and our ability to recover. So um, I did a big webinar on sleep, but it's a real passion of mine getting everybody sleeping well. Um, I've had my own sleep issues and I know the impact it has. So I really like making sure or trying to support, I should say, sleep as much as I possibly can because it it's sort of the foundation of which our other pillars of health stand on. <clears throat> so I want to support the adrenals. Uh, we do a product called Adrenal Support. So that makes it quite easy to uh, uh, choose. This is um, a selection of adaptogenic herbs. So we have uh, Siberian and Panax ginseng, Suma, Tianchi root and licorice root. This is quite building for the adrenal glands, and I find it really useful if there's um, a lot of fatigue present. So we also have pantothenic acid. So B5 is the um, nutrient that's most utilised by the adrenals, but also um, with some kelp that provides iodine, which helps support the um, thyroid as well, because the adrenal and the thyroid are very closely linked. And obviously, actually, if the thyroid's struggling, that's going to contribute to fatigue as well as as well as brain fog and everything else so it's quite a good idea to give the thyroid a little bit of a boost indirectly so i do like this one for helping to build up those um energy levels um so nutrients that used up in the stress response I already mentioned b5 which is a cofactor for energy production b6 is needed for the adrenal gland activity in the stress response we also use up vitamin C, and obviously, um, although vitamin C is important for the adrenals, it's also really important for the immune system. So we don't want sort of stress driving nutrient depletion. Um, and we're not getting enough nutrients to then be able to support our immune system. Magnesium is depleted in times of stress. It's also needed for a healthy stress response. And zinc is also depleted in times of stress, or used up a lot more um, by the adrenal glands. And that plays an important role in supporting the immune system and the body's stress response as well. So again, a lot of these nutrients, if we're using them up with stress, that's then affecting um, the availability of these nutrients for our immune system and inhibiting the sort of recovery from a viral infection. Hmm. So um, we always want to think about B vitamins in times of stress, but they're also really important for energy production. So they're cofactors for a lot of enzymes that produce energy. They're important for the metabolism of fats and protein. They're important for the function of the nervous system. Um, can improve symptoms of stress. Also important for mood because a lot of cofactors, um, they're, they're, they're cofactors for the production of neurotransmitters, sorry. Um, and then particularly folic acid and B12 are needed for serotonin and other neurotransmitters. So, Always a great idea to get some B vitamins in there as well. Hmm. On top of that, general stress management techniques. So exercise, meditation, relaxation, my favorite sleep, and then you know, good, good food that's going to nourish, um, nourish you as a person and support adrenal gland function. Things like forest walking, um, I've got this picture in there because I just really like that picture, but um, have been shown to be very, very useful for reducing stress levels. So getting out in nature, really, really important. <clears throat> so if there's still immune issues going on, we really need to support the immune system. Another sort of hypothesis of um, post-viral fatigue, and then it's coming out a bit with long COVID as well, is that these viruses are laying dormant within the body and they're still eliciting a very mild response. And this is you know contributing to these constant symptoms although they're not in high enough levels or they're not being sort of expelled from the body as much so they're not you know triggering a positive test um but they're you know eliciting mild 
inflammation and oxidative stress and damage, general damage to the body. So we really want the immune system to be working effectively. A, to get rid of any um, dormant viruses that may still be hanging around, but also to protect us again from the secondary infections and all these sorts of things, which are only going to you know, exacerbate these chronic fatigue-like symptoms that we're experiencing. So all these lovely nutrients that we um, love for supporting immunity, so vitamin D, C, zinc, NAC, quercetin, vitamin A, selenium and beta-glucans. <clears throat> Getting them in the diet, it's a good idea to take a multivitamin and mineral to make sure you're getting optimum levels of all these nutrients to help support them. We have a great product called Immune Complete. We have Immune Complete One, which is for um, women of reproductive age and, and sort of people that are still growing, so it can be used by teenagers. Or Immune Complete Two, which is for men and postmenopausal women, which has a lower level of iron. But that contains all of these nutrients um, in one multi um so we've also got knack and quercetin and some other antiviral nutrients as well as beta glucans as well as a broad spectrum of vitamins and minerals so that was designed specifically with um covid19 in mind and looking at the research that support of what nutrients were looking supported for protecting against and helping recovery from covid19 quercetin itself um is a nice one particularly because inflammation still hanging around so quercetin has been shown to have antiviral effects against both RNA and DNA viruses. And it has a pleiotropic role as an antioxidant and an anti-inflammatory. It can modulate signaling pathways that are associated with post-transcriptional modulators which affect post-viral healing. So it does a multiple level of things. So quercetin has been really, really indicated with COVID-19 because it is anti-inflammatory and antioxidant, but also antiviral. Um, so it's covering so many issues that we're facing with a COVID-19 infection. Um, so studies have shown that it promotes viral eradication or inactivation, and it favorably modulates viral induced pathological cellular processes. So it modulates what we've particularly seen is the um, N NLRP3 inflammasome, which has been strongly associated with the cytokine storm that we see in patients with a really significant infection. Okay, so now we want to look at the function of the mitochondria. And I would say anyone that's suffering with long COVID, you want to be supporting their mitochondria. So you know the functions um, influenced by hormones, trophic factors, cytokines, so inflammation, neurotransmitters, and coenzymes. So we need to make sure that you know the body has all the ingredients it needs to be able to support optimal health and therefore the health of the mitochondria. If there's anything else going on, we need to ameliorate that as well. Um, but generally, we want to look at nutrients that support energy production within the mitochondria. Um, I've got a few, a few slides in another presentation that goes through you know, glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Um, but this is going to be a reasonably short webinar, so I didn't go right into the sort of nitty gritty biochemistry of, of all of that. Um, but we want to make sure there's the presence of nutrients that are important for energy production. So the B vitamins are essential. The ones that are most utilized in energy production would be one, two, three, and five. But the B bits are sort of all support each other. So I usually recommend more of a B complex or a multi with good levels of Bs as opposed to these individually. And then good old CoQ10. CoQ10 is an essential part of the electron transport chain, which is where we produce um, energy, we convert NADH, which is an electron acceptor, into ATP, which we can use for energy. Um, and if CoQ10 is depleted, this can affect the ability of the body to be able to do that because CoQ10 acts as a, um, an electron transporter, but also as a bit of an insulator. So it helps prevent basically loss of energy within the mitochondria. And that also helps protect the mitochondria from oxidative stress. So CoQ10 is so important. So anyone with um, long COVID, I look at giving CoQ10. Iron can be depleted at, um, by COVID-19 infections. So it's important and it's utilized by the mitochondria. So it's important to think about, but if, if you, I wouldn't give it in, too high, in high doses unless you're looking at someone's iron status. 
Copper as well is used by the um, electron transport chain. Amino acids, so making sure people have adequate protein. We need amino acids for our Krebs cycle to be working effectively. And carnitine is great because carnitine helps in, um, get fatty acids into the mitochondria. So that helps support the utilization of energy from fat instead of from glucose. And that can be really, really useful. Another product that's useful is D-ribose. This is a building block for ATP. It's been shown to be particularly useful in people with um, congestive heart failure, but also for um, post-exercise recovery. Um, but there's quite a lot of um, uh, studies that have looked at the use of D-ribose for supporting not so much long COVID yet, but definitely chronic fatigue syndrome, and it's been quite useful. So it supports ATP production by encouraging rephosphorylation, particularly within muscle, including cardiac muscle. So it sort of provides this building block and allows energy production to continue if um, the availability of ADP is a problem. Um, so it's used effectively in chronic fatigue patients. It can also improve exercise tolerance. So if you've got people, um, I've seen a lot of people that have self-reported long COVID and the symptom they worry about the most is really their inability to exercise. So they can sort of just about carry out day-to-day -day functions, but whereas before they'd be able to go for a run or a long bike ride or something like that, they're really, really struggling with that. And that's when I would definitely look at using D-ribose. <clears throat> so our mitochondria is specific, particularly um, vulnerable to oxidative stress. That's because then, you know, they're not protected by the mitochondria and they're very active and they create their own oxidative stress as well. They create free radicals all the time. Um, so they get often they're getting quite damaged by oxidative stress, but they do have their own innate antioxidants to help support that. But what we want to do is make sure that we're helping them out by um, reducing any other factors that can be creating oxidative stress. So things like smoking, obesity, excessive inflammation again high stress levels, high sugar diets, trans and hydrogenated fats, pollution, um, chemicals from household products, toiletries and cosmetics. Um, yeah, so if we can reduce the exposure of all of the above, that can help reduce free radicals and oxidative stress. So it's not just sort of ameliorating the oxidative stress with antioxidants, it's looking at what other things may be overwhelming our antioxidant capabilities that's creating excessive amounts of oxidative stress. But obviously important as well are antioxidants. They neutralize free radicals and protect against damage, but they also help maintain cell integrity and normal biological and physiological functions. Um, so uh, mitochondria themselves will produce their own antioxidants. So will utilize innate antioxidants such as superoxide dismutase and glutathione. But if those antioxidant systems become overwhelmed, we can become, um, we can get into trouble. So it's really useful to um, support those systems with ensuring there's optimal levels of nutrients that are used as antioxidants. So zinc, selenium, vitamin C, vitamin E, alpha lipoic acid and CoQ10. I like those two because they really support mitochondrial function as well. Alpha lipoic acid along with L-carnitine again helps to support the utilization of fat for energy within the mitochondria. NAC again, and acetylcysteine is the precursor to glutathione, or you can give glutathione um, as, as a supplement in its own right, and I'll talk about that in a second. So the thing with glutathione is, <clears throat> it's been shown to um, be reduced during a COVID-19 infection. So we get the attachment of um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus to an ACE2 receptor and it's taken up into the cells and that releases um, nuclear factor erythroid 2 related fact sorry nuclear erythroid 2 related factor or NRF2 and what NRF2 does is it leads to the inhibition of the release of glutathione so <clears throat> you know um these viruses are really clever. They're, you know, they survive by um, 
mutating to be able to overcome our own immune system. And one of the ways it's done this is it's managed to reduce the production of glutathione. Um, and that in turn reduces the availability of anti-inflammatory cytokines and increases reactive oxidation species. So we get higher amounts of oxidative stress and uh, higher amounts of inflammation that we see. And this is also associated with an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines. So it's a bit of a, you know, it's tilting the seesaw both, from both ends, if that makes sense. Um, so glutathione is really, really important. It's our major intracellular antioxidant. So it's really important for supporting the mitochondria, but also just protecting the health of the cell. Um, and already, just with the COVID-19 infection, we're going to get reduced levels of glutathione. So we definitely want to be supporting those. Another thing that um, is shown to be uh, reduced by um, SARS-CoV-2 is NAD. So NAD is used, again, for energy production. So it's used by the mitochondria to make energy. And it's an electron acceptor. So this is, you know, it's, it's a currency of energy that we can't utilise. So NAD then goes to the electron transport chain and is converted into ATP, and we can then use it for energy. So a lot of studies have looked at the use of nicotinamide riboside. Nicotinamide riboside is a form of B3 that is the direct precursor to NAD. Um, and it's essential coenzyme that plays important roles in various metabolic pathways. It's been shown to upregulate the CERT enzymes, for example, which are associated with anti-aging and anti-inflammatory um, pathways. Um, but also it's essential just for uh, energy production for mitochondrial function. So SARS-CoV was found to inhibit electron transport, the NADH site of complex one in the electron transport chain. And that suggests that key events in the innate immune response to viral effect infections are occurring within the infecting cells, the NAD metabolome. A uh, recent study investigated uh, PPAR expression and NAD plus metabolome dysregulation due to coronavirus infections. So we've basically got dysregulation of, the, um, of energy production within the cell. And a lot of studies have looked at using nicotinamide riboside post-COVID-19 infection that's been really useful for helping support energy production, therefore helping to ameliorate fatigue. So supporting mitochondrial function post-COVID, um, I would certainly look at utilising um, nicotinamide riboside. We also do a cell-active glutathione. So if you just take glutathione orally, it's broken down within the gut and it's, it's absorbed in its sort of constituent parts. So it's an expensive way of just getting a lot of, you know, NAC, for example, and selenium. So our cell active glutathione is encapsulated in an isosome, which means it's um, transported intact across the gut lining. It can also cross the blood brain barrier. And we know that, you know, inflammation, not state of stress within the brain is going on as well. So it's really useful for helping ameliorate that. So I definitely recommend this cell active glutathione. Um, if someone's really struggling with fatigue, we can certainly um, add in supporting the D-ribose as well. And then we want to probably be using a multivitamin a mineral to ensure that you've got all the other cofactors, such as the B vitamins, the CoQ10, the antioxidants, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> again, back to my favorite subject, sleep. Um, a lot of research has been done with the use of melatonin. Now, as nutritional therapists in the UK, we can't use melatonin um, therapeutically. These are lot, this is a lot of studies that have gone on in the US. However, melatonin has been shown to have an inhibitory effect on the NLRP3 inflammasome. So again, this is the um, inflammasome that's been shown to you know, create this cytokine storm. But... Um, and it's highly activated, it's still creating inflammation, whether you've you know, had a really severe um, COVID-19 infection or not. And if we've got ongoing inflammation, we really want to be ameliorating that as much as possible. So um, two published patient papers have proposed the use of melatonin as a therapeutic agent in the treatment of patients with COVID-19. 
as it has antiviral, anti-inflammatory and antioxidative effects. So we can't, um, as I was mentioning, we can't prescribe or um, use melatonin therapeutically, but we can certainly help support sleep and that will naturally help support melatonin production, particularly by you know, supporting serotonin production during the day, using something potentially like 5-HTP, but making people, sure people get out in the sunshine. And then making sure their room is dark at night will aid the um, production of melatonin. So, you know, I always, sleep is a really important pillar of health along with exercise and diet. Um, so I talk about three pillars of, of health, but sometimes I've talked about it as the foundation that the other two sit on as well. So you can look at ways at um, improving sleep and you can go and have a look at our um, sleep webinar, but just sort of general sleep hygiene is a good idea. So here's a little tips for a good night's sleep. So eating no less than three hours before bedtime, avoiding alcohol and caffeine, particularly just before bed and too many liquids. You can look at um, L-tryptophan, 5-H and magnesium rich foods, or use something like a 5-HTP um, supplement to help support support um, serotonin production and therefore the conversion of melatonin at night. Quit smoking and exercise regularly. So these are all things that we would be using, um, you know, pretty uh, substantially anyway. <clears throat> Neuroinflammation. So this is um, a sort of real legacy that happens post COVID-19 infection and it's certainly something that would lead to conditions such as depression, brain fog, poor ability concentrating, you know confusion just not quite feeling as sharp as usual. We definitely want to be thinking is there inflammation going on in the brain or neuroinflammation. So um, when post-mortem investigations were done on patients who were infected with and then died of COVID-19, um, they've shown that the virus across the blood brain barrier and they seem to cross via the olfactory pathway and go into the hypothalamus. So the olfactory pathway is, you know, the nerves that, um, you know, connect, connect the nose to the brain basically. So travel up the nose into the brain. And this is probably why there, well, almost certainly why there is loss of smell and loss of taste um, during a COVID-19 infection. And the pathway of virus, these viruses seem to follow that previously seen in chronic fatigue and ME patients. And it involves a disturbance of the lymphatic drainage from the microglia within the brain. So the microglia are sort of immune cells that are present in the brain, but we don't seem to be able to, it seems to almost block the drainage of the lymphatic or the glymphatic system within the brain. So one of the main pathways of the lymphatic drainage of the brain is by the perivascular spaces along the olfactory nerves and through the crib form plate into the nasal mucosa. So we've got damage to the olfactory nerves, but also blockage of the perivascular spaces, which is reducing the ability for us to sort of drain off this toxic um, infectious material that has been deep, you know, it's been dealt with by the immune system, but we can't get it out of the brain. So it's hypothesized that this leads to a dysfunction in the lymphatic or within the brain, we call it the glymphatic drainage. And that creates inflammation. Um, we see increased levels of cytokines, particularly um, IL-7 and um, gamma, gamma interferon. Um, and it's thought to be this buildup of cytokines in the central nervous system that contributes to fatigue-like symptoms. It will also affect the integrity of the blood-brain barrier, allowing for further molecules to pass into the brain and further exacerbating inflammation. So essentially, we get, we've got a leaky brain. Um, it's essential to help attenuate inflammation both systemically and particularly within the central nervous system. So we really want to be reducing inflammation. Another sort of side effect of this inability to drain the lymphatic system is intracranial hypertension, which would cause a lot of um, you know, headaches and migraines, visual disturbances in particular. Um, and it's thought because, because we're unable to you know, drain this um, lymphatic system effectively, we're getting a buildup of pressure. So we're getting this intracranial pressure, which is creating hypertension within the brain. 
And that's contributing again to fatigue and chronic fatigue-like symptoms, also headaches, brain fog, and migraines, et cetera. So it's really important that we, as much as we can, help to attenuate this inflammation within the brain. <clears throat> so we get an inflammatory vicious cycle. Again, we get further damage, mitochondrial dysfunction. We get stress. That can create insulin resistance. We can, can give us more cognitive issues. So basically, we're getting further damage to tissues within, within the um, central nervous system. So we need to look at anything that may be driving inflammation, high omega-6 to omega-3. Again, it's in resistance. Leaky gut, I'm not talking too much about the gut, but really important for attenuating inflammation. And again, when the gut's leaky, that's associated with the leaky blood-brain barrier. So you really want to be supporting the health of the gut as much as we possibly can. Not necessarily because leaky gut was the original, although it could, you know, it could put potentially be, but the original driver of a neuroinflammation this time. But if we've then got leaky gut and that's driving further inflammation, you're going to get further problems. So we need to attenuate anything that's triggering that inflammation. Excess toxic load and dysbiosis as well. So we need to remove the causes and increase all these um, lovely anti-inflammatory things like omega-3 fatty acids, dark leafy greens, prebiotic foods, polyphenol, polyphenols, curcumin. So I'd really recommend our cell active curcumin, like the um, glutathione, it's encapsulation liposomes that can cross the blood brain barrier. Really, really useful for attenuating inflammation in the central nervous system. So if we're getting significant cognitive issues, I would, that would be one of my go-to products to look at. <laughs> Ginger and antioxidants as well, really important. Um, and then we want to make sure this is central nervous system is functioning as well as we can. So omega-3, B12, methylfolate. Now I've certainly recommended those two, sometimes in a B complex, but sometimes on top of each, on top of a, um, a multi with B, with B vitamins in, because um, when there's loss of taste and smell, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, we've certainly got um nerve damage that's gone on at least within the nose then on the nasal nasal cavity of the olfactory nerve but probably also in the central nervous system and b12 and methylfolate really important for supporting um no, the health of the nervous system additionally um people that have really struggled after vaccination have sort of done quite well with b12 supplementation so i'd certainly it would be an idea to add in a little bit of extra b12 then otherwise zinc, vitamin D, and a broad spectrum B vitamin complex, um, really useful for supporting nervous system function. So, you know, you want to attenuate the inflammation, but you also want to um, support the function of the nervous system as well. <clears throat> I've said most of this, but we know that the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus seems to um, travel along the olfactory nerve and through this crib form plate um, and allows it to enter, enter, the, enter the brain. But also, as it's traveling up here, it seems to really damage the epithelial lining that sort of lines the olfactory nerves um, and the receptors, but also potentially damages the nerve, nerves themselves. And this is what we, is the hypothesis at the moment um, that creates this loss of taste and smell. What we found is zinc is really useful. So zinc itself helps to attenuate the attachment of the virus to the ACE2 receptors anyway. So it's been shown um, that zinc is an essential component of ACE2 receptors and helps to normalize ACE2 receptor function. So it actually is shown to be helping to prevent the... Um, the binding of the spike protein to the ACE2 receptor. But on top, um, on top of that, zinc supplementation seems to be really useful with post-COVID recovery um, for getting back people's uh, sense of taste and smell. You need a reasonably high dose. So it's 45 milligrams of zinc per day for three to four weeks. You don't want to stay on it forever. Um, but after three weeks of quite high doses of zinc, I, we've seen 
um, patients start to get back their loss of taste and smell, even when it's been you know, gone for a reasonably long period of time. So definitely would look at um, zinc status or giving a bit of extra zinc with those, those people. Um, on top of that, we're seeing vitamin A being quite useful, and that's likely because um, the loss of smell is also due to damage to the olfactory epithelium. And vitamin A supports epithelial regeneration, shows potential for the regeneration of olfactory neurons. So this is quite new research and we don't quite know the, um, the mechanisms of action yet and how it's happening, but um, supplementation with vitamin A seems to be really effective as well. Um, I said I don't talk about gut too much, but we really, you know, we always need to think about it with any anything that's going on within the body. It's a, it's the seat of all health. So consider what the gut's like because it's so important for the immune system, for you know, nutrient absorption it has a massive effect on cognitive function. So you know, does your gut look like a barren desert, or does it look like a very biodiverse ecosystem? We want it to look like a biodiverse ecosystem. So think about leaky guts. Do we need to um, uh, attenuate leaky gut, as I mentioned before, because it's creating further inflammation and a leaky brain, but it's also going to affect the immune system. Um, it's also going to affect neurotransmitter dysregulation, increase, you know, we all know the side effects of leaky gut. And we talk, I've talked about it in nearly every presentation. So I was thinking I wasn't going to talk about it too much. But it's really important to think, is there damage that's gone on in the digestive system? So we've got particles that are passing across and creating further inflammation. And it's quite likely that uh, a COVID-19 infection probably increases gastrointestinal permeability, so probably increases leaky gut, because we know that you know infections and antibodies, for example, are things that can you know, damage the gut lining. So we want to think about healing, healing the gut, providing nice, healthy bacteria for the gut as well. So there's lots of things you can think about. Um, we're going to have a separate presentation on gut health. But certainly look at live bacteria supplements and prebiotics. So fast inulin, polyphenols, you know, lot, again, lots of fiber in the diet is really important. Is there excessive amount of inflammation in the gut? We need to use more anti-inflammatories. And short chain fatty acids. So you know, live bacteria that help produce cement fibers and produce short chain fatty acids um, is something to look at, look at as well. So um, a strain such as bacillus coagulans is really useful. So if I think there's leaky gut, the product I like to use is Cytoprotect GI tract. Um, it's designed with lots of nutrients that have been shown to be really supportive for the, the repair and recovery of the gastrointestinal lining. So a general protocol, so I don't want this to be set in stone for anybody because it's going to depend on what's going on in the person. And like I've said, you need to think about, you know, are there gut issues? Are there further immune issues? Do they need extra cognitive support, or mitochondrial support? You know, or is there underlying cardiovascular issues or stress? So this isn't a, a one size fits all, but this is a general protocol that I use and find quite effective, but it, like I said, there's nuances to it and it really is sort of investigating all those things that I've talked about today. But um, the sort of standard protocol that I've used is um, Immune Complete. So Immune Complete is a multivitamin and mineral designed with nutrients that support, particularly with nutrients that support the immune system. So it's a full spectrum of vitamins and minerals, but with an emphasis on immune supporting nutrients. So it also has, and some antivirals in there. So it also has N-acetyl cysteine, um, some lysine, some quercetin and beta glucans in there. Um, as I say, number one is uh, relevant for um, women, and, women and teenagers, and two is more uh, relevant for postmenopausal women and men. <clears throat> so I use that as a foundation. On top, because CoQ10 is so important, so we also do a CoQ10 multi, and I'm sometimes like, which one do I give? Because I want to support the immune system, but I want to support the mitochondria as well. So on top, I've added Cytorenew. You could use the, 
the cell active glutathione. Cell active renew is a little bit um, more cost effective, but it has um, CoQ10. It also has um, NAC, which is the precursor to glutathione. Again, which you see, we've got sort of double dose of NAC there, which is great. Um, it's got L-carnitine and aphrodisiac acid, so it also really supports mitochondrial function. Um, and ginkgo, which helps to support um, cardio, you know, cardiovascular. So I like it because it's getting not. It's designed for as an antioxidant, but also to support energy production. So alongside the immune complete, I really like that combination. Um, and omega-3, um, I put krill oil, but you can use the vegan omega-3 or the high strength fish oil. I like krill oil because you have a bit of astaxanthin in there and it's in a phospholipid form, very well um, absorbed. Um, but you want omega-3 to attenuate inflammation, to support mitochondrial and cell membrane health, to support um, the health of the nervous system. So there's lots of reasons why I would always add an omega-3 in. Certainly B12, I usually find people do well on extra B12, particularly if there's a lot of cognitive brain fog type issues and nervous system issues. Vitamin D, I haven't actually talked about it excessively, but there was a lot of studies that um, were put out, particularly um, during the initial um, pandemic, where high amounts of vitamin D were really useful at helping protect against infections. And people that were getting, you know, really um, severe infections, a lot of those people had vitamin D deficiency. So it's an association with vitamin D deficiency and severity of disease. But also post um, COVID recovery, vitamin D seems to be really useful. Um, the nicotine, my riboside, I love. Um, it's quite an expensive product, but I would put it in there because it's really useful and there's a lot of studies that are going on with its use at the moment. Um, really good for supporting mitochondrial function. So particularly if there's fatigue and again, sort of brain fog, I'd be looking at the nicotinamide riboside. And then you really want to, you know, support the gut. So a multi-strain probiotic such as Acidophilus Plus, again, very, very useful. So that's my general protocol. But as I've said, I know I've mentioned lots of other products and it is really, really digging down for each individual and sort of working out what, you know, what's relevant for them. But I think this is a really good starting place. So I hope that's been useful for you. Um, if you do have any questions or want sort of further information on protocols, because it's, it's actually, as you start getting into it, it becomes such a wide topic that you could you know, go down loads of rabbit holes with it. So um, I hope it's been useful and please email me if you have any questions. I also have a Facebook group. Um, I think it's quite hard to find, so I'm going to try and make it easier to find, but it's uh, Helen Drake Practitioner Education on Facebook um, and there's a bit of a group there and you can ask questions on there as well. Um, so thank you for listening and I hope to see you again soon.